Hello, Shay. I am super excited to be talking with you today. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm great. How are you? Yeah, very good. Very good. It's always lovely to speak with our certified mini tarot advisors. So I am really looking forward to hearing more about, you know, your tarot journey and what's transpired since you've taken this program and all the amazing work that you are doing. But first, yeah, let's start. I want to start with your journey with tarot. How did you find tarot and at what stage and what did it kind of bring into your life? You know, it is interesting because a classmate of mine, a former classmate of mine actually introduced me to the tarot and I had known about it for a long time, but until she uh, introduced it to me, I didn't really have any connection to it. But she said in class one day that, that she wanted to combine tarot with dance movement therapy. And I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. That was maybe back in 2019. And that was my first introduction. And then my curiosity kind of peaked during COVID where I thought, oh, I really want to get into this. You know, I was home, not really doing much of anything. And I somehow remembered that conversation with my classmate. And I just thought, you know what, let me just pick up a deck and just see what happens. And then it just stuck with me. And yeah. so I didn't have like a formal introduction per se, but uh, because my classmate introduced me to it, it became, and, and there's a sentimental because we're friends too. Yeah, yeah. And did you end up using it in the dance therapy? That sounds really interesting. I am starting to explore that now that I just graduated. I'm I'm really looking into how to combine all the different modalities that I'm uh, certified in or interested in. So tarot, mental health modality, sound hearing, and dance with therapy. I'm trying to figure out how to put those all together. Yeah, beautiful. I think that, yeah, there's so much power when we bring together these different modalities and kind of create these like unique combinations. I'm seeing more and more of it and it's, yeah, just delightful, I think. What was it that made you decide that you wanted to become a certified Biddy Tarot advisor? What was that motivation that goes, yes, I'm doing this? Well, we'll talk about parts in a minute, but uh, even before I knew about parts, there was this there's this desire that I have to be great at anything that I'm putting my mind to. And my thought was, if I do a certification process that will give me the knowledge that I need and it puts me, it gives me a little bit more credibility, um, but also it assures that I have the knowledge that maybe I wouldn't necessarily come across naturally if I was just doing my own self-study. And there were a lot of things in the program that I remember thinking like, wow, I would never would have even thought to consider that unless I had read it. So that's what really drew me to the program. I'm a big fan of certifications and really having the piece of paper that says you're certified to do what you're doing. So that yeah. was my thought. Yes. And uh, what were some of those biggest shifts that you experienced? Like you're like, oh, I've not thought of this. What were some of those for you? I really didn't think about it from when you're doing reading the whole picture and how to put things together in a way that advises the, the person to make decisions on their own. I think there was just a shift about more than just this is the meaning of this card. It was a bigger implication about this is what this means to your life and what is the story of your life that you're seeing in your cards or that you can see, you know, going forward. So I think it was just a a bigger perspective than just simply this card means this. Yeah, because I think oftentimes when we think of tarot, or when others think about tarot, they think, oh, it's, you know, pull a card, say what it means, <laughs> job done, right? right? Mm -hmm. And you and I both know that like there's so much more potential, right, in tarot. And I think that too links back to bringing in these different modalities is what really helps us to access that greater potential. So now that you've completed the certification program, which I believe was just at the end of 2022. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> What's been some of your biggest achievements since you've taken the program? Biggest wins? I officially started doing tarot readers professionally. That was the biggest achievement. I felt ready to start to come out in the open for public release, so to speak. This summer, I've had a number of different events where I've gone to like different fairs or festivals to read for people. And that was definitely a change because up until that point, I've been doing reading mostly online. Mm. And so doing it in a public space where people are walking by just adds a different experience. 
And so now I, I remember thinking to myself, like, okay, we're here now. There's this like officialness about it being in the public eye. So th those are my biggest achievements, definitely. Yeah, awesome. And it is, you know, it is kind of a jump and, and leap going from that online space, which we designed to be so like just safe and nurturing and a beautiful place where you can learn. And then, yeah, you kind of have to take that next rite of passage almost and start reading for people in real life. Were you a little bit nervous at the start? Like how did that kind of play out for you? Oh, definitely. I have a lot of imposter syndrome parts that are like, are you sure you can do this? It was definitely nerve wracking. And sometimes my mouth speaks quicker than my brain is processing. So many times I've had to like slow down and try to get through a reading and be clear. And I've practiced, you know, breathing through the reading and not rushing through it and also giving some time and space for any feedback. I'm really good at reading body language if there's something that's not clear or unsure. So it was nerve wracking trying to make all that happen all at once. But once I got to a few more events, it became a lot more natural and I didn't have to think about it as hard. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so you're continuing to read Tarot professionally now. And where do you think you'll take that whole practice in the future? I really want to incorporated into coaching. So I received uh, a number of different um, life coaching certifications also at the beginning of the year. And the funny thing is I had been working on them for probably like two years off and on. And I just had the time and space to be able to dedicate the time to um, become certified as a mindset coach. And so what I'm hoping to do one day is to incorporate tarot into the mindset coaching because I feel like there's a lot of mindset work that comes with once you interpret the cards, it's like, okay, what does this mean? And how do I change my mindset around this? Yeah, absolutely. And what I love about that is that it's really tapping into that empowerment, like tarot is a tool for empowerment rather than kind of the usual, like, this is what's happening to you or your fortune telling kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Now, I know you also do this work around internal family systems. So I, I know nothing about this. And I would love to hear about what is it and then how are you starting to integrate it with your tarot practice as well? Oh, man. Let me make sure I can stay on track. <laughs> so Internal Family Systems was created by Dr. Richard Swartz or Dick Swartz back in the 1980s. And he really, it almost like it happened in happenstance because he sort of realized in his practice that he was already doing as a therapist, he came across his realization about the existence of parts, which are really these sub-personalities that exist within us. And we, we speak in this language pretty regularly. You know, I have a part of me that wants to do this and another part of me that wants to do that. And it's really examining those parts within us that are operating at any specific time. Um, so there are three types of parts. We have managers, which are the ones that manage our daily lives, the, the operational people, so to speak. Um, you have your firefighters who come in and they soothe, distract, or make, take your attention off of the things that are really painful. And then you have your exiles who are the most vulnerable parts, usually young parts that hold our pain, our wounds, our trauma. So when those exiles get triggered, it's the firefighters that come in and, you know, say, let's get a drink after work. It's that kind of conversation. And then your managers are... Thinking, they're very proactive and they're thinking to themselves, okay, what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen again? Mm. And so they manage your life, you know, like if you're, let's say, imposter syndrome that we had talked about. So they make it so that you, there's always a need to kind of prove yourself and that becomes a part because based on maybe a narrative that got implanted maybe as a child and then now there's this constant need to prove and show that you're good instead of just existing. So that's yeah. parts in a nutshell. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. And then how does the family concept kind of interrelate and connect with that? So it was named that because Richard Schwartz, he was originally a family therapist, but then he realized he, that families exist in us. So our managers, our firefighters and our exiles are all one big family, not happy family, <laughs> sometimes it's functional family. And that's how he relates all of our parts. So his, the, one of the biggest goals of IFS is to develop a relationship with the parts and for the parts to relate to each other. 
Mm -hmm. A lot of times we talk about how the parts are polarized, meaning that they have completely different viewpoints of how things should go. And sometimes, and a lot of times they clash. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of why he named it a family, because in families that happens a lot. And that's why he named the modality internal family system, because it's internal family that sometimes needs some evaluation, so to speak. Yeah, right. So the goal is really to bring that integration and perhaps awareness amongst those different parts of ourselves. Is that right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Do you know, it it kind of reminds me a bit about like the court cards. And I often talk about, you know, with the 16 court cards, but we, do you ever look at, do you look at that sort of relationship, potential relationship of the parts and whether it's court cards or the parts and tarot, like how does that start to come together? Oh, man, I really believe the court cards and, you know, there are 16 personalities and I see 16 personalities within every single person. And sometimes I think they represent what maybe we're trying to attain or maybe what we're trying to achieve. So maybe, for instance, the Queen of Wands, very social, very um, good with people. And maybe that's an underdeveloped area in our lives. And that's what we're trying to achieve or we're, we're looking towards. So I think the core cards can provide a lot of perspective on what we see in ourselves, but also what others may see and maybe what we're trying to become. Mm -hmm. So there's so many dimensions that exist in it. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And is that that our parts can change and evolve? Do we want to try and change and evolve them or are we accepting them for who they are and what they are here to do or what, you know, to be a witness to them, I guess? Like what's, what's the difference there? Definitely. So Dick Schwartz says there are no bad parts. And that's one of the titles of one of his most recent books. All parts are welcome. We don't want to try to wish them away. We don't want to get rid of them. We want them to become, like you said, integrated into our being. And that takes a lot of examination and developing that relationship. Like I understand where this imposter syndrome part or this people pleasing part, whatever part you're talking about, I can understand where that has been placed in my life and how that showed up in my life. And also one aspect, the other aspect of it is the self with a capital S, which is also, Carl Jung also talked about this in his work too, where it's this core being, the seat of consciousness and is what Dr. Schwartz said. And when we're what we call blended with our parts, where we have less access to self. And so once we understand our parts and develop a relationship with them, we can access more self Mm. qualities or self energy or self leadership. Yes, I see. It's almost like being able to be more of an observer of these parts. Is that kind of where that Mm -hmm. goes? Yeah. Yes. An active observer though. Yeah. I, I, as a therapist, I have noticed when I have an intellectualizing part that's trying to intellectualize what my client is saying instead of being with them or witnessing them in an open way. But I'm trying to analyze and and try to make sense of it when maybe that's not really what's needed in the space at that point. Mm. Um, so right. So recognizing when those parts come into play, come into the front seat, driver's seat, so to speak. And when you can happen, you can let them soften back or say, can you sit in the audience while I, you know, interact with this person? Mm. So it's about the relationship. I can see how that could play out really nicely for tarot readers. So have you had that experience like where you're doing just a tarot reading versus like an IFS session? How do you use this parts work to support you when you're reading tarot for someone? Well, because I have worked a lot on my own parts, I know when they're in the space. So I know that when I'm having my imposter syndrome parts, the parts that are you know, encouraging, so to speak, self-doubt, I can say, I hear you. I see you. I know that you're here. Would it be okay if you just had a seat in the waiting room while I deliver this reading to this person, knowing that I'll come back to you later? I'm not forgetting about you. So it is really a conversation. It sounds kind of funny from the outside, but it's really a conversation about my relationship with the part. And that I'm not forgetting about. I'm not abandoning it. I just need it to have a seat while I do something else or while I focus my attention on something else. Yeah, I think that's neat because oftentimes I hear from readers like, oh, I know. How do I know like if this card's actually meant for me? And 
you know, am I just bringing my own sort of bias into the reading? Well, what I can imagine is if you have this awareness of these parts and you can actively work with your parts, you can again ask the part to move into the waiting room. I love the waiting room concept. It's great. So that then you can be that pure channel for your client. You can be fully present. Yes. And what it just, it sounds like that's a really beautiful, simple technique that many readers could put in place, you know, straight away, right? <laughs> Exactly. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, audible to the outside. You can just say, you know, I hear you. I hear that you're in the space right now, but I was just wondering if you could. Sometimes as people say, my, my former supervisor would say, can you have a seat in the audience? Can you sit in the waiting room? Can you soften back? Any phraseology that makes sense to you um, where you're acknowledging the part's presence, but also saying, I'm going to get back to you later. Mm. I'm not abandoning you. Yeah, beautiful. And then when you're doing a, an IFS session with someone, do you integrate tarot cards into that session and that practice? I plan to in the future. I think because depending on the person's comfortable comfort level with using tarot or any kind of divination tool, I haven't in the past. Although I've been asked about it, one of my goals in my next clinical venture is to start integrating into the clinical space. And it, because it's a really powerful tool, sometimes a visual is very helpful. So seeing a, a part that's in a car. So, you know, maybe your six of wands reversed might mean your people pleasing part, you know, the part that needs external validation. So just incorporating that, seeing that on paper, it's like, okay, I can see what this looks like now. Mm. Yeah, because I imagine it'd be powerful. You could use it either as consciously choosing from the deck to represent the part that you've already become aware of, or in those cases, I'm sure there's times when people go like, I don't, I don't know all my parts, like what are they? And then maybe tarot can help bring that out of that subconscious mind. Oh, absolutely. Especially if we're, we have a full moon in Aquarius today. And when you're doing spreads around any type of astrological concept, when you start to see themes in the cards around certain things, that might mean there's a part that really is needing your attention. So if maybe all the cards are certain suits or they're all major arcana cards or they're all court cards, that might point to something that maybe your attention is not on and bring it to your conscious awareness. So I think that's the most powerful part of it because, yeah, it could be an exploration or if you already know and it can evolve. So even if I think my perfectionist part might be the queen of swords. Maybe over time, maybe it might be something else. So it's really just always evolving and so dynamic. And that's what I think the beauty of it is. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like what a beautiful intersection of these different modalities where I just think tarot makes things come alive, you know, on a whole new level. And it's almost, it's just like this little creative partner with these other modalities do you find that like when you're doing your practice in in other areas Tarot just is kind of it's, just wants to come and play along right <laughs> oh absolutely and that's how I came across doing this because I was actually journaling in the bitty chair journal and something like a voice came to me and said hmm, I wonder how your parts are working with this I was doing a spread and I thought and I started writing about parts and you should see the page. It's just like a mess, like all these different words and different colors. And it just came to me like, wow, I can see how powerful this is and how different realizations can come through that you weren't even thinking. Like you have the original question from the spread, but then it, it's like beyond, like what are the bigger implications of my parts and how they're playing into this whole idea? So. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So tarot can feed the parts work and then also parts work can feed the tarot. And when you're doing tarot readings, it kind of works across both ways. Yes. Yeah. Especially when you start adding astrology and other things into it, then it really gets, <laughs> you can really go, you know, really far with this. And that's one of the pieces I've, that I've been adding as of late, um, studying astrology and how that plays into our parts and our karmic lessons in life. So that's been a really interesting exploration too. Yeah. Wow. I could imagine. And then you've also got, like we touched on it earlier, the dance movement therapy. And how do you anticipate bringing that and tarot together, for example? I remember once where my former supervisor, when we were doing group supervision, 
we were talking about how to incorporate the creative arts therapies into IFS. And one of the things she did was she's a drama therapist or hoping to be a drama therapist. And she did these motions like, you know, what does this part feel? Does it feel like this or does it feel like this? And I thought the tarot cards can have that same energy too. Like you can have the emperor to me is just a very staunch presence or you can have the queen of wands who's very like dynamic and very, very connected with others. And so just, and that could be like emotion, you know, like what does a queen of swords energy feel like in my body? What does the emperor feel like? What does the hierophant feel like? You know, is it very like, you know, stable or is it dynamic? Is there a movement? Is the page of pentacles just like this person that's speaking knowledge and, you know, what does that energy feel like in your body? And, and the nice part about dance movement therapy is like not a dance. It's not a dance style. It's not a dance technique. It's what is, how do you embody anything that you're feeling or how do you embody a tarot card or a tarot card energy? And so that's where it gets really interesting. You could, and there's no right way or wrong way to do it. And that's what's awesome about it. Yeah. Yeah. I've just really moved into that place of like movement and using it as kind of your like, yeah, personal development, spiritual growth type experience. It is so powerful. And it's, to me, it's that big transition has been, this is not really about dance. It's about movement and it's not about how do you look to others. It's more about how you channel this feeling and this energy through your body and just the movement of the body almost like locks in all of the experience and oh man you just got my brain going because you know imagine like you could just do like even your four queens right and use that to really explore the elements plus this queen energy or the whole like fool's journey imagine doing that as like a whole moving meditation and oh Oh, I thought about that (laughs) (laughs) It was like, oh man, that would just be an incredible like piece if you put that all together. Movement right. Meditation. And then like, and, and I think back to the parts, cause you did touch a little bit on archetypes and I'm wondering if we go a little bit deeper there, because uh, I imagine that these parts can sometimes be like the archetypes and our major arcano cards are certainly the archetypes of Tauru. How have you seen those coming together or playing out um, in the parts work? I've studied a little bit of Jung's work um, over my graduate program, but also in other tarot realms. And I found that a lot of those archetypes also exist within us. Like we have, we all have the hero complex. And that's the one thing I've realized. We, even the parts that are, I would say maybe lower expression or lower vibration, we've all had them at some point in our lives. We have expressed all of the archetypes in our lives at some point. And instead of saying like, man, I really regret that I did X, Y, Z, you can take accountability for it, but also recognize I could see where that came from. So I think recognizing that we all have these archetypes within us, you know, the mothering type or the, you know, cold type, you know, like whatever archetype, you know, you've seen, it's appeared in some way, maybe. And that's part of the exploration too. Maybe you just weren't aware of it at the time, but it was there. And there's no, we don't want to get on ourselves and, you know, come down too hard on ourselves because we've all had our moments of low, lower expression, low vibration, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. As long as we can show compassion, which is one of the eight C's of self energy, we can show compassion and also take accountability for the things we've done that we're not proud of. Yeah. And I almost feel like just in the naming of it or the identification of it, the the healing already starts to begin. Even, you know, when you do things like the inner child work or like your inner mean girl or that inner critic, just giving it an identity and a name. And then you can start to go, this is probably your parts work, right? Then you go, oh, there's that part. So rather than feeling like, I'm this awful person, it's just like, oh no, there's my part. Exactly. Well, one of the eight C's of of self-energy is curiosity. Uh And by picking up a card, and we were talking earlier about if you're like picking a card intentionally to represent a part versus you're picking randomly, simply by doing that, you are in self-energy because you're curious, like, how does this card resonate with the energy that I'm feeling? Or how does it match what I view this part to be in my life? So you're already extending some self-energy in just doing that but alone before you've even done anything else which is really Mm. amazing 
And again, and see how powerful this can be both as like a self practice, like something that you can do in your own personal practice, but then also what you could easily do with clients in these types of sessions. Yeah. It's really beautiful. So if we've got folks listening who are like, oh, it sounds so interesting. Like what could be, what are a couple of things that they could do to start to integrate this concept even that we have different parts and how could we use that in tarot? Well, just for starters, I actually did create a guide that will lead you through how to incorporate the tarot and IFS. But just for starters, if I think to myself, or if I sit down with my deck and I say, what is the part that needs the most attention right now? And I say, my imposter syndrome part. And I can go through the deck and just find a card that seems like it represents what that means and meditate on it and just take in the energy. There's a whole process of getting to know your parts. You know, you find the part, focus on it. What is, where is it in my body? Is it an external presence? Is it internal? And that's how you're fleshing it out. Where are the thoughts and emotions? And then you say to yourself, how do I feel towards it? Not how do I feel about it? How do I feel towards it? Mm. And that's how you're assessing if there's any self. If there's a, I want to get rid of it, I'm angry by it. That is another part that's speaking. So it's really a, a really deep practice. And every, almost every IFS book you can find will outline this process. But just for starters, finding a card that resembles a part for you is powerful in and of itself. Because then you're looking at the cards a, a little bit differently, right? Now it's not just about maybe an external situation or another person. It's who you are. It's a part of you. Mm. And so I think that's a really powerful practice. And then you can start to develop more self-energy, more compassion, more clarity, more connectiveness towards it. So, yeah, it's, I, I love this stuff because it's so, it's like a simple thing. Like it's easy. It's simple and incredibly profound. <laughs> And deep, you know, you can go as deep as you want into it. And, you know, like you said, you were journaling about all of the different parts and you're taking that quite deep, which is great. You just kind of slip in there that you have a guide. Tell me more about this guide that will help integrate IFS and tarot. Well, my perfection part, my perfectionist part was very strong in creating this guide because IFS can get very dense and it's very powerful. Um, and what I wanted to do was just simplify it so that you can understand the basic concepts of the different types of parts, what it means to be in self. We also, I also touched upon what we call burdens, where the parts take on an extreme, usually negative belief, and then that becomes the part's burden. And once you become unburdened, you can be more in self. So my guide basically outlines a very quick version of IFS, and then I have two spreads one for getting to know a part and then one in accessing some more self-energy. And that one is really brief, like three cards. And I really think it's powerful too, because for self, you know, what are the, uh, the different qualities? I lay out all the eight qualities. What do all of those look like? Like what does it, what is calm in the tarot? What is compassion in the tarot? And then you take that and say like, what's been hindering that in my life? And then what has, what actions can I take to get more of that, to access more of that, or elicit more of that in my life? So, it, and then I end it with some resources. Like if you wanted to read more about IFS, there are resources that are geared more towards professionals. And then there's resources that are geared more towards the individual. So I wanted to make sure people had that because depending on who's reading, they might want both. So hopefully it's enough to at least pique your curiosity and then continue your exploration from there. Beautiful. My perfectionist part admires your perfectionist part. <laughs> yes. And that's one thing I touch on too. One of the quotes I put in there talks about how we relate to people based on once we understand the concept of parts and our parts, then we relate to people very differently because we can see where their parts might be. And it gives us more compassion. Like, oh, I understand maybe if you have a boss that's very much a perfectionist, like maybe that's rooted in something deeper that I may or may not understand and that gives them more compassion to extend ah, yeah yeah that's powerful and so where can we find out more about the guides that you've created so i created a landing page that has the that you can download from it or if someone wants to contact me directly i can send it to them it's a pdf that has all the guides and or all the spreads and also the information about ifs 
so that someone could just take it and they have the basic understanding and they can apply it right away. It doesn't, you don't have to do like an intense, deep study of it before you can apply it. You can just jump right in. Yeah. And, and what's the URL? What's the website? <laughs> it is really long. It is, I have to get it up, but it's not quite as. All right. What's well, in that case? We will put that definitely into our show notes and then you can easily click on it. But yeah, it sounds amazing. I know that so many of our listeners will be very intrigued and curious to learn more. So make sure you check that out in the show notes because we'll put the links there. Beautiful. And, and like, what else is coming into your world? Like over the next six to 12 months, how do you think you'll be evolving and shape-shifting in, in your work? Well, as a clinician and as a professional reader, my goal is to really create an experience. Like even in the cl clinical space where, you know, I'm providing therapeutic services, just creating that healing experience and whatever healing means to that person. And also giving them some ways to do so, you know, mental health is a field. It's very short internationally. There are not as many mental health providers as we need, the supply and demand proportion is very off. And so what I hope to do is give people the tools so that they don't have to feel alone. They can do this on their own. Um, they can, you know, as they're waiting for a mental health provider, especially depending on what area they're in, it could be even tougher just because the numbers are lower. Just giving people some tools that they can use in their own life. It's, I, and I think it's beyond coping skills, right? Because that's the one, that's the short-term thing we give in therapy. But I think it's more deeper understanding of self. Mm -hmm. And so that when you go to your mental health provider, when you finally get that provider, you have a deeper understanding and the work can happen a lot faster because you've already started the work. And yeah. so then when you go into the space, then you've already, the process has already started. And I think by doing by incorporating tarot, especially if you just have a deck that you connect with, you can do that work all the time. And maybe when you do like a daily card pool, you know, what's the energy of today? And you pull a card and it, that could be signifying a part. You, you just don't know. It's just, it can be. That's the exploration. That's the fun part of it. Yeah. And so my goal is to, I, I always like to keep things practical, right? Like all this stuff is sounds great, but how can I really use this? And that's what I want to give people, something that they can actually use that is meaningful and impactful for them. Yes. Yeah. And even I was sort of connecting in with that concept of coping strategy. It almost what came to mind was like, this, that's kind of what you do after the house is completely burned down. Here's how to clean up the house that has burned down. <laughs> right. right and, exactly. And cope with what's just happened versus something proactive like the parts work and the tower is more about, well, how can you make sure that your home is safe and, you know, a really nice place to live in and you don't ever have to worry about it burning down because, you know, you're already in that like different higher vibrational state. So yeah. But also dealing with the, the grief, dealing with the sadness, dealing with the, the part of you that feels like somehow you contributed to it or somehow it was your fault, dealing with all of that, knowing that those are also parts too. And knowing that they're welcome and they are totally, they totally make sense. And then help having that be part of the process in, in addition to the kind of external things that you're doing, um, yeah. getting that deeper understanding and compassion for yourself too. Yes. Yeah. The whole self, light and shade. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. And so where can people find out more about you? Do you have a website that you can share or your Instagram? And again, these will be in the show notes, but I'd love for you to share as well. Yes. So I am on Instagram at Cancer Moon Wellness. And I chose that name because I have a Cancer Moon, Capricorn Sun. And I feel at shelters though, being a Cancer Moon, and I've only really realized that I am a Cancer Moon, my it really speaks to my intuitive nature, my nurturing nature. It is in everything that I do. And I thought, of course it should be called that. And Cancer Moon Wellness is really just a way to integrate all of the different modalities that I'm familiar with and that I've studied. So at Cancer Moon Wellness is my Instagram. And from there, you can find my booking if you want to book a reading or anything. But that's where I'm most active for sure. 
Yes. Beautiful. Okay. And do you do like online parts work type sessions and readings and so on? I'm figuring out how to do that in a way that makes sense. I have talked about it briefly and I've also shared some information about my mental health journey and how I'm using parts work to, to further that journey and to better understand myself, which I think is really powerful because as a therapist, you know, we think we're supposed to have this image to the world like we're so perfect and we know how to cope with things and that's just not true we're some of the worst individuals to follow our own advice right and so sharing a lot about my parts and how they come into space and how they inform a lot of what I do um, without being disparaging towards them right so I do so I want to share more about that in such a way that makes sense and I do have a lot of colleagues that are also exploring tarot and IFS so hopefully we'll come together and also maybe put that out to the world too. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much for today's conversation. I think you're a true inspiration. You really are. I love how you're integrating Taru with the parts work and also just, I can feel like that pure intention and that desire to be of service to those in this world and to yourself too, knowing that like the more that we can grow ourselves and create that kind of in a balance, the more that we can help others as well. So I'm super proud of like what you've been able to create. It's amazing. And yeah, thank you again for just sharing your wisdom and your experiences. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was so wonderful. I get so jazzed up about all this stuff. So I'm just super <laughs> excited to be able to share. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, if you love this video, then make sure you check out this next video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you next time.